Welcome to Healing Generations, a podcast creating a dialogue uplifting the importance of healing, strengthening, and supporting our communities, and that addresses the disparities and inequities in communities of color. Healing Generations is brought to you by the Healing Generations Institute, a collaborative initiative of the National Compadres Network and the Brotherhood of Elders. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our new releases. Welcome to the Healing Generation podcast. My name is Ariel Jimenez, and I'm back as your host for the youth voice portion of this podcast. Before we get started, we wanted to start off by wishing all of the fathers a happy Father's Day. We acknowledge your struggle and appreciate the effort you all put into being sacred fathers. We also acknowledge the young fathers in their lives, the ones that might have started their fatherhood journey sooner than anticipated, but those that jumped into fatherhood and have stepped up to fulfill the role. With that being said, we welcome you today, and I pass the palabra over to my co-host, A.B. Ozuna, who will introduce himself and our guest for today. Welcome, A.B. Hello, my name is uh, A.B. Ozuna. Um, Happy Father's Day uh, to all the fathers out there. I know I'm really appreciative of all the men I have in my life, and I know what wonderful fathers they are. Um, Speaking of wonderful fathers, I want to introduce our guest, Jairo Bustos, born and raised in San Jose, California. He graduated from Mount Pleasant High School and attended San Jose State. Currently works for our Fresh Lifeline for Youth. Um, Biggest compliment has been being a father to Zeke Zeke and Zinea. Pardon me if I mispronounced that. Um, But yeah, uh, I was wondering if you could just uh, introduce yourself, say a little bit about yourself um, and what you want our listeners to know about you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, AB. And uh, thank you, Ariel. I'm glad to be here with y'all. Uh, my name is Jairo Bustos. Um, I am the father of Ezekiel Bustos Chires and Zania Rose Bustos Chires. Uh, graduated from San Jose State a couple months ago. Currently work in the Youth Voice Department at Fresh Life Funds for Youth as a program lead, where I'm able to supervise uh, three great mentors who work with uh, some of our youth who are being released from the James Ranch and the DJJ in Stockton. Um, Also got the chance to be a part of Circulo when I was in high school um, and got to lead a Circulo in East San Jose uh, in 2015 with some great young men. Um, So yeah, that's a quick intro about myself. No, definitely. Thank you for for introducing yourself and and definitely welcome. Um, I think today we're going to embark in a lot of different conversations uh, surrounding the work that you've been doing and also a lot of the work that you did as as you're kind of getting introduced to your own healing journey. Uh, But I know you mentioned being in Circle and also facilitating Circle, but just going back to the initial question, um, how how would you define healing? Like for those people that may be not familiar with the word, not familiar with that journey, how would you put a definition to the word healing? So personally, the way that I would describe healing is acknowledging your traumas and embracing those traumas and learning how to overcome them, Um, being able, being okay with sitting and like being uncomfortable with what reality is and really uh, being honest with yourself and working towards overcoming that, like I mentioned, yeah, that's the way I would define it myself. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, he- healing's hard to put a definition to sometimes. Um, I know I struggle with it a lot. Definitely, I think it's hard to to put a definition to to healing just in general. But I think what's important is also to to know what we're healing from. So if you were to talk a little bit about maybe some of the traumas, uh, not specifically that you face, but what are some traumas that some of the youth are facing t- in today's world? Um, so talking about today's society, whether it was COVID-related or not, what, what what are some things that you want to identify that the youth are currently struggling with? So I think I'm really going to pull on my my experience with working with the population that I've been working with the past couple of years at Fly and, and when I was leading Circulo. Uh, one of the main traumas that I noticed was uh, displacement in terms of like youth having to relocate to different communities, um, having to immerse themselves into different social groups. I'm sure many of us have changed different schools throughout our life, and we know being the new kid could be uh, terrifying. So on top of that, having to perform academically um, is a burden and having to you know, feel like you're behind because you know when you move schools, you feel like you're falling behind academically. So like, it could push some youth to kind of just 
feel overwhelmed. Also, um, it's really expensive to live in the Bay Area. And I know all of us know that here. Um, and I think with that, a lot of the youth that I, that I got the opportunity to work with had parents who were working two jobs. And it's difficult for youth to be held accountable and to have support when their parents are working throughout the day and they get home, there's there's nobody home but themselves. They have to care for younger siblings a lot of times. I think that displacement can lead to trauma. And also the impact that social media has on the lives of our young people, um, I think specifically with what they view as success, I think social media it obviously plays a big influence on what our youth view as success. And I think it's a glamorized lifestyle that a lot of times is unattainable. And when youth aren't able to attain that lifestyle, they view themselves as a failure. And I think, you know, just leading to, you know, feeling depressed, um, I think that definitely could lead to trauma as well. For sure. Social media has definitely played a life in my role when it comes to wanting to fit the perfect idea of what we're supposed to look like today and how we're supposed to act and stuff. Um, but going back to you as a youth, what were some traumas and obstacles that you faced when you were younger? I think I would say thinking back to uh, when I was born, uh, the relationship that I had with my mom led to the trauma of feeling unwanted and not feeling like I was worthy of anybody's love. Uh, because the way that it was explained to me was that my mom... When she had me, she didn't feel that she was ready to take on the responsibility of of raising a baby, which, um, you know, I understand her decision now. But when I learned about that when I was younger was, you know, it made me feel like if my mom doesn't love me, then like who else would love me or why should I love myself? Um, I think that was kind of the root of a lot of my traumas. Um, also, because my mom uh, didn't have the the ability to kind of care for me. Uh, my grandparents did, and they did a great job, and I felt like I had a great relationship with them. So by the time I had gotten to the sixth grade, I had lost both of my grandparents, which to me was the equivalent of losing my mom and my dad. I think because you know, when you when you go through life, you kind of have somebody that you feel like has your back at all times, whether it's your mom or your dad or which other you know, uh, adult it is in your life that has your back, that supports you no matter what, and that loves you unconditionally. And I felt when my grandparents passed away, I didn't have that. And I was navigating through life at 11, 12 years old by myself. Um, also, the biggest trauma that I could look back to was uh, the presence of domestic violence in my home. And when my grandparents passed away, I moved in with my mom. And there was a lot of domestic violence with my stepdad, with my mom and my little brother, and to the point where it made me feel uncomfortable to go home. So I would do anything to not go home because I didn't want to be around that. Um, Unfortunately, that led to me being involved in bad activities because that's what, what I was able to access to not go home, which led me to get into a lot of trouble. But, you know, looking back, that's what what gave me the most anger. And uh, yeah, I would say definitely the most anger growing up. I was just really angry all the time. And I think that was the root of it because I saw that and I felt so helpless that I couldn't help my mom. And that, you know, that stayed with me for a long time. Yeah, no, definitely. I appreciate you for for unpacking and also sharing a lot of what you've gone through because I know it's not easy to go back to those memories, even as an adult, right? Even as an adult, when we're trying to talk about some of those past wounds, if we haven't fully faced that trauma, it could still re-trigger us. But thinking about one of the things that you mentioned that really stood out to me was, you know, feeling unwanted and feeling unloved and having to love yourself. If I may ask, how did you overcome that journey? Like, how did you learn to eventually love yourself in that journey? Uh, That's a good question. I, when I learned how to love myself, uh, I would say when I got to high school and I think I was a sophomore, a sophomore or junior in high school, and I started working uh, with Fresh Lifelines for Youth, which is the organization that I work for as a staff now, but I was a youth there as well. And working with uh, my case manager, I think she 
And I think I've talked about it so much that it kind of like I forget how much of an impact she had on me. But she was able to to show me that, you know, I was worth somebody's love because she gave me her love. Um, and I think she was the first person to do that. And after that, fortunately, I had a lot of people who who showed me my worth, who who showed me that I was able to to be loved, you know, after her. But I think she was the first one to not only do that, but also I think at the time I had a lot of resentment towards women, I think, in my life. And she showed me, she kind of guided me in that in that journey to let go of that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your experiences and your healing process. We were wondering about how, um, with all the trauma you went through, how you were able to overcome it, you know, still smile and bring joy to those around you. I think to touch more on that, one of the things that I started doing was letting go of the anger and resentment that I felt towards other people, uh, specifically my stepdad and I don't know who it was, but someone told me to put myself in other people's shoes. Maybe I heard it on TV. Maybe someone told me directly. I don't remember. But I did just that, and I didn't understand him, and I didn't sympathize with him. But I understood that those were his actions, and there had to be a reason behind those actions for him. And I didn't know his whole life. Um, So I didn't fully forgive him, but I started to let go of that anger that I had inside, but also... um, like I talked about earlier, like I felt like I wasn't loved. And I think a lot of that had to do with like that also led to me feeling like I wasn't capable of being successful. So what I did was I kind of took my stepdad and I made him like my motivation to accomplish everything, every goal that I set for myself. And and w- when I got to my lowest point was um, when I was in I was on probation, juvenile probation for three to four years. And I was in juvenile hall when I was a a sophomore in high school. And that's kind of like the lowest point where I felt like I had no worth. And I kind of took him in the back of my head and I kept him in the back of my head and all the negative condescending things he said about me. And I let that fuel me uh, for what was like a difficult journey that I had ahead. And that's how I healed. Like, I guess you could say I healed with making myself feel like I was being successful, like I was worthy and I used him as my main motivation. And I think I I still use him as my main motivation, you know, to this day, one of my main motivations. Yeah. I think, um, I think there's a lot that you mentioned, right. That especially talking about anger, resentment and forgiveness. I think those are all powerful uh, elements within our healing journey that we have to acknowledge. And then also, you know, mentioning your, your stepdad in terms of how he added that motivation, not necessarily in a healthy way, but that was like fuel for you. But thinking about not only what helped you overcome these struggles, but who helped you overcome these struggles. And not in a negative way in terms of fuel, but if you had to pinpoint some of the people that maybe might have supported you in your healing journey. Because I know a lot of the times while we're at our lowest, like you talked about being at your lowest, being incarcerated sophomore year in high school. Sometimes at those moments is when we feel the loneliest. So coming out of that, are there any people that you want to lift up that lifted up? while you were feeling down? Yeah, um, it's it's hard to put myself back in that time. But I think, um, you know, Ariel definitely was one of those people. Um, I think just providing me with support. And Ariel, I don't know where you were, like in the prior years when I was going through all that, but I think you came in at the time where I really needed somebody and you gave me that support to, to heal and that like home that I needed. And also, uh, just like all the the mentors that I got to work with at the time, whether it was from my case manager to all the women that I got to work with at Fresh Life Lines for Youth that served as mentors for me, they they allowed me to be myself. They allowed me to kind of find myself and who who I wanted to be. And I think that really helped with my healing journey. It was definitely Ariel. Um, getting closer with my family through Ariel and... Um, those mentors that I had in my life, uh, you know, I'll, I'll name them off with Raina, Susie, and Julia, I think really helped me out a lot. For sure. I mean, when people work with you and help you and really show you who you are and, like, that you're loved and constantly remind you what you're worth, it's, you can see it really impacted on your um, 
your work. So we were wondering, uh, what work are you doing right now that you want to highlight in the sense of healing generations with youth, et cetera, whatever you want to highlight? Uh, in terms of the work that I do, um, that I hope is helping my community is, uh, like I mentioned before, working alongside the mentors that are working with the youth in our program. I think these are these are youth that have been through significant obstacles in life and are have been incarcerated for long periods of time and are assimilating back into society. So our mentors specifically have lived experience. Uh, you know, they've gone through their own obstacles, whether it be uh, in the legal system or, you know, just very big traumas that, you know, make them suitable to work with these youth and just like working alongside them and also kind of like helping develop those mentors to work with those youth and help those youth heal because, you know, that just from meeting those youth, I know they're great. They have a lot of potential and it's just difficult like it would be for anybody to assimilate to a whole new lifestyle when you're so used to uh, being in an institution. Um, so that, that's what I'll say on that. No, definitely. And, and I appreciate that too, right? When we talk about like reintegration, I think one of the biggest things that I learned um, is, you know, how do we prep our youth, our adults, our men, our women to really reintegrate back to a community that might not be ready to receive them? And I think that's one of the biggest obstacles, right? But thinking about kind of where you at right now, career wise, you mentioned Fly, you mentioned some of your mentors in terms of Reina, Susie. What motivated you to come into this field? Like out of all the different careers that are out there, wonderful careers that are out there, what made you want to work for Fly right now? What made me want to work for Fly was knowing firsthand the impact that they had on me um, and understanding that if I come into this work, that I could. Uh, maybe play a role in that impact. Not to say that I'm directly going to impact someone the way that I was impacted, but, you know, if I could come in and make any positive impact, then that's uh, rewarding for myself, um, which is the reason why I decided to, to do this work and to work at Fly specifically, because I believe so much in them. And that's why. That's awesome. I mean, we need more people like you that are out there to help our youth and advise them and be there to be there to be their person to go to their mentor um speaking of i want to talk more about what you have in mind for your future what do you see yourself doing working with do you still see yourself working with youth and why uh i'm not sure exactly where i'll be at career wise uh so i just got um, admitted into uh, Golden Gate uh, Law School. Um, so I'm still waiting on one more law school, but I'll be starting law school somewhere in the fall. And I think at this point, I'm just thinking like, you know, I'll go through law school and I'll figure out what type of law I want to practice after. Because um, there's, you know, the short time that I've looked into it, I know there's a wide array of careers that you could do with a, with a law degree. Um so I'm kind of leaving that up in the air and, you know, I'll decide once I uh, finish law school in terms of what the future looks like after that. I just want to stop for one second, though. Just acknowledge the fact that that Heido just came in here, and, like made it seem like it was nothing. Oh, yeah, I just got my admittance to law school. Like like <laughs> if it was not a big accomplishment. So I do want to just lift you up for a second because I know getting into law school, there's very few people that even choose that career. And the people that choose that career, there's very little people that even get into law school. So I, I just want to take a moment and just say congratulations. Thank you. Right. Um, and, and secondly, you know, thinking about you just shared being at your lowest sophomore year in high school, being in juvenile hall to now years later, maybe a decade later or less, then talking about law school, getting admitted and in the fall, you're going to be starting that. Like that, that is a journey that we need to lift up, that we need to talk about, that we need to say, what did you struggle with? What did you succeed with? Who helped you in that journey? Where did you stumble? Where did you take steps back? Like, it, it's not like, I just want to make sure that we lift you up in a good way and just say congratulations in general. Um, but no, definitely, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what the future holds for you. Definitely in that courtroom and, and everything else that, that might come up. 
Um, thinking about law school, though, knowing that you're starting in the fall, what made you go that route? Like, how, how do you see that impacting the community in the future and why go that route? I think to start off, I want to say that my kids motivated me to to reach for higher accomplishments than I thought I could accomplish. But specifically law school, um, I got the opportunity a couple of years back to to hear a, a prosecutor at a Boston. I think he's out of Boston. His name's Adam Foss. And he spoke about his, his story for one, but also the impact of that he had as a prosecutor. Uh, but as a prosecutor, you know, he, he's a, a man of color. And, you know, at, uh, at the end of his speech, he kind of mentioned that we need more, more lawyers of color. And that's kind of like the first like time that I, that it got into my head that I thought about law school because of the impact that he was able to have on his community. And that's kind of where it all started. Uh, you know, thankfully, I was able to to connect with individuals who worked in the legal system here in my community. And then they were able to kind of make it seem like a reality uh, that I could even go to law school. Because uh, when I was in high school, I didn't think I'd go to college, like community college or like any college at all. And, you know, I made it through college. Um, and I never thought I would go get my master's or anything like that. And, you know, they kind of made it seem attainable. I think specifically, uh, you know, talking to uh, Johnny Gogo, who's who's now a judge, he was one of the, the people who kind of like I saw as a man of color who made it happen. And also uh, Byron, who uh, is uh, a lawyer as well, who kind of guided me through the whole process. You know, all those people that I surrounded myself with made it seem possible, you know, when it seemed impossible just a couple of years ago. Uh, that's awesome. I, I First of all, congratulations. Like, law school, I could never do it. Law school, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, wow, that's that's so cool to me. Um, so I want to ask you, because law is is difficult, you know. You're, you're going to come across a lot of tough trials and a lot of scary things um a lot of people's experiences and stuff like that so i was wondering what impact do you want to have as a prosecution like what's your legacy you want to leave behind uh so i'm not completely sure if if i want to be a prosecutor yet um or if you know what type of law i want to go into honestly at first i did you know go in with the mentality that i wanted to be a prosecutor but i think just to to looking at it from that lens, just to bring the perspective that I have into the legal field, I think is what um, what I think I would want to leave behind. Uh, hopefully to bring change to the system, which is something that, you know, I've, I've been working on with like other endeavors that I've been taking on, but, you know, just uh, bringing a different perspective that not everybody has. Thank you for that. And, and just kind of going a little bit in a different direction, right? I know earlier... You talked about your children, you, you know, when you introduced yourself, talking about, you know, Ezekiel and Zaniah. How has that journey been? So we talked a little bit about, you know, being formerly incarcerated. We talked about some of, some of your relationships when you were growing up. But as a father right now, how has that journey been just being, you know, the, the father to Zeke and Zaniah? And just dive in a little bit into that. Uh, I think in terms of you know, your question was how it's been. I think saying that it's been hard is an understatement. Like it's been the hardest, but most rewarding thing of my life. Um, I think from the beginning, you know, like when I was, I think uh, at one point in my college career, uh, when Zeke was going to be born, uh, Zeke is my oldest. So um, I think it was difficult to to think about like what the future was at that point, I was nervous. Cause I, I was scared about like, am I going to go back to school? Am I going to finish school? Um, and it was really difficult to learn how to balance life, learn how to balance school, learn how to balance work. Because at the end of the day, I had to provide for him. But I think it just it made me responsible because I had to make that change. Um, also gave me a sense of purpose. Like I, I don't know. Like, I can't explain the feeling of. You know, when Zeke was born, holding him for that first time is just 
you know, I'm sure all parents could relate. It's just uh, I've never loved someone so much in my life. And I think that's what um, what drove me, you know, whenever I'm doing anything and I'm always thinking about them, whether it be, you know, the actions that I take now don't only affect me and reflect on me, but it's also for my kids. But also, um, you know, when things got difficult in college and when I was struggling, uh, not to pass my classes, but to get the grades that I wanted to get and to work. And when I was exhausted, I just thought about him. Um, and then eventually I thought about him and Zanaya. And I think being a dad just, you know, it just pushed me to, like I said before, reach for for higher achievements and from my perspective. Um, so that's how it's been going. But I think one of the things it also did too was it taught me to let go of bad relationships that I was holding on to for a long time. You are obviously giving your children a good role model of what a parent is supposed to be like. Tough, strong, uh, persistent. You have that perseverance, especially when it comes to school. I mean, law school, I can't get over that. Um, So I was wondering for you, what would you say the sacredness of fatherhood means to you? I would say... um, just providing love and support. I think in as simple as I can put it, I think those are like the most important things because, you know, I'm, I'm going to be here for my son and my daughter's journey and I'm going to support them every, you know, every step they take. Um, and, I, and I mean that like, because I feel like I grew up with my parents were kind of like very like, I think at least my dad was like very like you had to do it if you don't do things the way that I see it, then I don't really like support you as much. No, I like have support you because you're my son, but I don't fully support you. Um, and I, I just know that as a father, like it, like I'm gonna support my kids like fully, no matter what they they decide to take on, embark on, and also just like being there to nurture them, and you know, whenever they're they're going through difficult times, being that support that I felt like I needed when I was struggling at a younger age. So thank you, um, you know, thinking talking about fatherhood. Now, this next question, and, and I don't want it to come off wrong. I, I'm, we're not promoting young people having children. But knowing that you were a young father, and, and remind me, you you became a father. You learned you were going to become a father when you were 20. And then you, yeah, had, when I was 20. you had Zeke when you turned 21, maybe like yep. less than a month after that. All right. So we're not promoting early childhood. But what I'm asking is for those young fathers that might be dealing with some of the stigma of becoming a young father or an unplanned, uh, you know, uh, parenthood, what is some advice that you would have for them to really dive into parenthood and fatherhood and motherhood and all of that? Because I know at the age of 21, even at the age of 20, having to have that hard conversation with your partner's parents and then having to tell your own family that you're going to become a father there could be a little bit of trauma even associated with that. So what are some advice that you have for uh, a person that is in their early 20s, late teens, and has just found out they're be- they're about to become a parent? What advice would you have for them? Uh, I think that's a good question. I think everybody has uh, different circumstances, right? My cir- circumstances were, you know, that, you know, I was in college and every- everyone might not have that circumstance is what I'm saying. But um, I think some some general advice is just like, as long as you put your kids first or your your kid, um, then that's all that really matters. Like as long as your kids are like the driving force of your actions, that's really important. But also just like being honest with everybody around you, uh, being honest with yourself in terms of like, you know, not setting yourself up to fail with like with surrounding yourself with too many like, I guess like extracurriculars, I think is what I would say. Like when Zeke was born, like, I took a semester off from school and I just focused on working and on like being there for him because when, you know, when they're babies, like, you know, there, there's so much that you don't want to miss, you know, they grow so fast. Um, so just like be ready to dedicate the time to, to your family and to whatever you need to do to take care of your family. But also I think when Zeke was born, it was difficult for me to, to figure out what I wanted to be. Like I mentioned before, what it, what a successful me look like. And I would say to that person to just like not let anybody else 
define what success looks like for them and to really take put a lot of thought into defining that themselves because at the end of the day like they're the ones who got to take care of their family and they're the ones who got to like you know take care of themselves so you're the only person who could define that um but i think also like it's it's uh i also come from like being a co-parent and having to have not only the difficult conversation with you know the mother of of my children like her mom and letting her know that you know i got her daughter pregnant and you know accepting responsibility and being ready because that's a difficult conversation to have and i just had to be responsible and go in and understand that you know i'm going to let her know that I'm going to be responsible and I'm, I'm ready for her to tell me whatever she's going to tell me. And I'm just going to listen. Um, and also, you know, telling my parents, telling my dad, I think it was for me personally, it was a little easier to tell my parents because I think my parents were happy, if anything, um, you know, that they were going to have a grandchild. But also uh, when it came to having a difficult conversation with the mother of my children, and, you know, this was what I was talking about earlier, of letting go of bad relationships and, having the conversation with her that you know, that I wasn't going to be with her anymore in the relationship was the the hardest thing I've done in my life. Um, because I, I always told her, like, my parents weren't together. So whenever I have kids, I want to make sure that I'm with that person, like, forever. And I realized that, you know, I can't, I can't be the best parent I can be if I was in that relationship. So, you know, just not being afraid to let go of those bad relationships and not specifically just with, you know, your significant other, but also with like the people around you. Like, you know, there was certain people in my life that I, I felt like I didn't feel comfortable, comfortable bringing my kids around them. And, you know, I really only feel comfortable with me personally bringing my kids around family. So that's also like another thing, like, you know, having to cut off bad relationships because it's not just about you anymore. It's about your kids too. So, Heido, real quick, you know, thank you for for sharing uh, about, you know, some of those relationships that might not be the healthiest for us. I think it's important for us to to be able to identify what relationships are impacting us in a negative way. And then, you know, how to either transition out of those or how can how can I be better in those relationships? Right. But thinking about just your earlier relationships when you're in high school and transitioning to through a lot of different programs like Fly, like Circle. Thinking about back then when you were a participant, sitting in circle, learning some of those teachings, what do you remember most about participating and just sitting in circle? Uh, so what I would say I remember the most is I think learning about like being respectful. And, uh, you know, we I think it's very like we say it all the time as well with, about palabra. And that like I really like that meant a lot to me, like keeping your word. And that's kind of like the the first time that it was really like talked about a lot to me but also like I learned that it's okay to be vulnerable um as a man I feel like we there's a lot that like is expected from us like from society we got to be uh emotionless and we have to be tough and I think circle I was taught that it's okay to not be that it's okay to be yourself it's okay to be vulnerable I, I think also like something that I gained from circle was just like learning about like healthy relationships and understanding like what I wanted to like ideally be like in a relationship as a partner. I wasn't able to be that person yet in high school when I was in circle, but you know, I, I had that vision, um, you know, that was, that was taught to me in circle when we talked about healthy relationships. And I also, uh, was able to have, you know, gain more mentors there that were able to talk to me, not only in circle, but like, outside of circle and kind of like show me those uh, those teachings in real life um, who had my back. I think I, I specifically like think back to, you know, thinking about the impact of circle as a participant. Uh, when I when I found out that, that Zeke was going to be born, uh, one of the first people that I wanted to talk to was Miguel Ozuna because I had been in circle with him, but also because like he had so much knowledge to give me as a father. And, you know, I gained that through being a participant in circle. That's awesome. I mean, being for you, I would say it's it's a bit of a different experience because not only were you able to go through circulo yourself, go through the Hova Noble curriculum, but you were able to teach it. So knowing that you were able to experience both being in circulo 
and then teaching it, what different things did you take away from both of those experiences? I think the the difference from uh, leading Circulo myself was that, one, it was my first job outside of being a server and you know, like actual, like had to go into the office and be professional sort of thing. So I was like inexperienced in terms of like interacting with, you know, my participants. And I felt that a circle was such a a sacred space for me and such like a great experience for me that like I, I wanted to make sure it was that for all of my participants. And I really stressed over that. I think I got to the point where I understood that I had to like, just do my best and let them experience circle how they were going to experience it. And also one, uh, one of the other things that I'll note that was different about actually leading circle was that I now had to, you know, walk the talk, everything I was talking to my youth about like healthy relationships and being a man of your word. Like I had to do that myself and I had to showcase that to him, to them. And, you know, my, my participants, my youth would even call me out when I wasn't keeping my palabra and, I think that was the difference. You know, I was I was doing that to Ariel and Miguel and then now they were doing that to me. And I think I think that's really, you know, talking about that transition, talking about being in circle and even just hearing my so Jerry and Mario talking about the four four different phases of circle, right? Starting off as a turtle, then becoming a coyote, then a jaguar, and then coming back as a facilitator as a hawk. Right. So really that full circle where we you first start as a as a learning as a student, then you become the teacher. Diving in a little bit more into that, what made you want to become a circle keeper? Why did you want to create those spaces for other people to really talk about their traumas, really come in and and, and learn some of the values that were ingrained within our culture? I think one of the, the main things specifically about, uh, about Circulo was that at the time I was... Uh, taking a Chicano studies class at San Jose State. And, you know, I, I got to learn about, like, the teachings and the beauty of our culture. And I felt like our youth weren't aware of that. And they didn't, they weren't aware of the teachings. And I knew how impactful it could be to learn about your culture and, and learn about, you know, where we come from. And also specifically, I wanted to do that in East San Jose, where I grew up was very special to me because you know that that's home that's my community um so i wanted to leave circulo because i knew the the impact that i would be able to have on them but also like the tools i was going to be able to provide them and the teachings i was going to be able to provide them and ultimately uh create that sacred and safe space in the community where maybe the youth that i was working with didn't feel like they had that Thank you for that. And I think that's important, too, right? Because when we start to really talking about our culture, sometimes we we weren't really taught that uh, within our home, within our community. So it's really, you know, how do we reconnect? How do we uncover, recover, discover how Maestro Jerry teaches us? But I just want to take a moment to both you and AB for just really sitting with us today and really talking about some of our past experiences, some of the values that we learned along our journey. So just as we close up, you know, Heido, real quick, is there any closing remarks, any last minute um, knowledge, wisdom that you want to share with our listeners or or anybody that you're connected with? Anything else that you want to lift up? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to thank, uh, thank you, AB. Thank you, Ariel, for having me on here with you and sharing space with me. Um, but also to everyone who's helped me along my journey, I want to appreciate y'all. Um, to whoever is listening, I think in terms of like advice, I would just like uh, want to share with like the future generation to I think I had mentioned it a couple times, but to not let other people define success for you um, and to not ever feel like you're done because you know, although you might achieve great things, there's still going to be obstacles that are coming. So you got to keep yourself prepared to keep on overcoming those obstacles, but uh, don't let those obstacles discourage you. And I think just like, like letting them know, like I never thought I would be where I'm at. If you would have asked me like a couple of years ago, and sometimes, you know, it blows my mind to think about it. So I try not to think about it. Um, I try to keep on moving on to the next thing. But when I take time to reflect, um, you know, it it just surprises me. And I think that's also an important thing for everybody else is to take that time to reflect, to understand how far you've progressed 
and also acknowledge how far you got to keep going. And also uh, one of my last remarks, uh, I know I'm going to have my babies listen to this podcast when they grow up. So I just want to say Ezekiel, Zania, I love you more than anything in the world. Y'all my babies. And yeah, those are my last remarks. Beautiful. And I think that's important too, right? For us, um, even to acknowledge the love that we have for other people within our circle, especially our children. I know I'm not a father, but I appreciate when, when you say you you love Zeke and you love Zania. Um, now going back, you know, to AB, is there any closing remarks that you want to make sure that our listeners um, walk away with today? I just want to say, first of all, a very big thank you to Heidel for being here uh, with us today. Um, I mean, just hearing you talk was, it was really beautiful and it's going to be in, in my memory for a while, especially the law school. Um, <laughs> Cause I just want to, I just, I, there's not many Latino lawyers who go in with like a good mindset and who want to make a change in the, not only the world, but specifically their own communities and with their own people. So I think it's important that we have more people like you out there who want to help out the community any way they can in our youth and make sure that they, grow up and live a good life. Um, but to our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in again. Uh, we really appreciate you all for being here. Uh, any dads listening, happy Father's Day. Dad, if you're listening, happy Father's Day. You too, Miki. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. I couldn't have said it any better myself. Thank you, AB, for being an amazing co-host. Um, I think you definitely bring out the the best out of our guests. Um, Heido, thank you for sitting with us, but also just thank you for being real about your experiences, talking about, you know, what what allowed you to to really come out of that darkness, really come out of that space that you were in. And and I'm happy to to share your your success with you. So thank you for that. And as we wrap up, you know, some of the things that really stood out to me that you shared was not to let other people define success for you and not to let other people put a timeline on your success. That it's okay for for us to be vulnerable, no matter how you identify, for us to be vulnerable and, and, and show and express our love. And lastly, for us to reflect, understand, and acknowledge the progress that we have made individually. So I think just, you know, you shared so much with us, but I definitely wanted to lift up those three teachings that, that you share with the audiences. And again, to our audience who's listening, who's tuning in, thank you for, for always reconnecting with us. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for sharing with us. And, and we can't wait for the future conversations that, that we're going to have. Just as a reminder, make sure that you do follow us on, on all our active platforms, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and definitely on our podcast here, our Healing Generation podcast. Thank you all. And we look forward for any future conversations that we have. And again, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Thank you. For more information about Healing Generations and the Healing Generations Institute, visit nationalcompadresnetwork.org and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with our new releases.